gives me a great pleasure to present to you Governor Reagan. I heard Bob Hope say something the other day, and he's right. Bob says they're making them so big anymore that they're not going to show movies in them. They're going to just have Charlton Heston doing Ben-Hur live. April of 1972, after six years of development and unforeseen headwinds, Lockheed California Company, today's Lockheed Martin, rolled out the most technologically advanced commercial jet airliner of its time, the Lockheed L-1011 TriStar. Like many pioneering aircraft programs, the L-10 faced many challenges before it ever flew. Changing demands led to design revisions. Financial issues at Rolls-Royce almost left the aircraft without a power plant. And in the end, a recession fueled by the first global oil crisis brought an end to an era. Yet despite all of this, Lockheed engineers designed a truly innovative and groundbreaking aircraft. While direct connections are difficult to make, many of the systems and engineering features present on the L-1011 have, in some application, made their way onto every commercial airliner flying today. That's why I think the L-1011, one of the first planes I ever flew on, is definitely worth remembering. For some, the Lockheed TriStar is the original Dreamliner. Let's take a look at what made the L-1011 TriStar so special. Before the L-1011, Lockheed had limited success in the commercial jet market. In the past, they had built a small number of popular turboprop airliners, specifically the Constellation and Electra. Their first commercial jet product was the L-329 and later L-1329, named the Jetstar. The Jetstar quickly became an icon of the skies, and many still remember the screaming private jet, leaving long plumes of smoke in its wake. Or this. The Jetstar had four engines and was the first purpose-built private jet aircraft, seating about eight to 10 passengers, with a flight crew of two and a range of just under 3,000 nautical miles. The Jetstar first took flight on September 4th, 1957. Lockheed produced about 202 of these between 1961 and 1980. Of note, several Jetstars were powered by the Garrett TFE 731 turbofan. This derivative was in response to new noise regulations in the United States and complaints about high fuel consumption. The modifications were so popular, in fact, that Lockheed decided to launch Jetstar 2. With the success of the Jetstar and growing demand for larger, more capable aircraft, Lockheed set its sights on the next frontier, the commercial market. The early 1960s saw the advent of jet-powered commercial aviation. Increased comfort, efficiency, speed, and overall capabilities helped to expand the civil aviation market. Airlines started to dream of aircraft that would meet their needs exactly. At this time, the 707 and DC-8 were the only US-built jets in full production. The Convair 990's production ceased around 1963. And 
while small by today's standards, the 707 and DC-8 were, indeed, originally designed as transcontinental aircraft. The DC-9, Douglas Aircraft's short-range offering, did not fly until 1965. Boeing's answer to the DC-9, the original 737 series, was introduced in 1968. The massive 747 had her first flight one year later, in 1969. There was also the 727, however that aircraft served the lower end of original 707 and DC-8 operations. While the 747 largely took over long-haul 707 and DC-8 operations. Lockheed, through strong sales of the Constellation, Electra, and Jetstar, had built a solid customer base. They had a good reputation with TWA, Eastern Airlines, TransCanada, and American Airlines. Outside of these airlines, the folks at Delta and United demonstrated equal interest. This interest turned to action when Frank Koch, chief engineer at American Airlines, reached out to Lockheed. American Airlines was in the market for an aircraft that would have the ability to transit passengers from hubs in New York and Dallas overseas to Europe and South America. American had the 737 and 747 on order. They also desired an aircraft that could carry more passengers than the 737 while consuming less fuel than the 747. The 747 was truly designed to anticipate future needs. However, the airlines wanted something for now. So American reached out to Boeing, Douglas, and Lockheed. Boeing was completely occupied with the dual development of the 737 and 747 at the time. They were not interested. Douglas immediately offered the DC-10. They were able to do this thanks mostly to the DC-8. In many regards, the DC-10 was an upsized and improved DC-8. This lack of innovation, which has many interesting reasons, ultimately lowered development costs and provided for a quicker delivery time frame. Lockheed, without having an airframe they could successfully upsize and improve upon, was forced to start at the drawing board. They went all in. Lockheed Corporation would, in their words, take the most advanced technology of the day, and when that technology is lacking for our aircraft, we will create it. This commitment to excellence helped Lockheed create a plane that, almost too perfectly, met the specifications requested by the airlines. After finalizing their design, Lockheed released a name for their new jet. In Lockheed fashion, the company decided to name their new jet after a constellation. This time, a new one, TriStar. <laughs> 